Welcome back to another awesome video. Today we are looking at the Sears 61216167. Today we're going to look at this Sears tape recorder and talk about this particular type of cassette recorder in general. This style is sometimes called a shoebox cassette recorder. Do you know why? No. Well, because it looks sort of like it, it would fit in a shoebox, I guess. And believe it or not, some of the ways people use this style of recorder were not that different than some of the ways we use our smartphones today. Before I had a boombox or a real stereo, I had two of these shoebox recorders. Those are long gone or cannibalized for parts. This particular one belonged to my grandmother and was originally available at the Sears store in 1979 for $28.95. This had been sitting in a box since the early 1990s. So the first thing I had to do was to get it working. If you're not interested in seeing that part of the video, I will put in some YouTube chapter markers above or just skip ahead about two to three minutes. Since our last two tape repair videos had a James Bond reference, I thought this Bond theme songs tape would be appropriate, so I just put it in and here's what happened. Hmm, nothing but static, no tape movement at all, and now I've got a tape stuck in the machine? Well, that's not off to a good start. Well, anyway, I did manage to get the eject working again by jostling the box a little bit, and then I opened it up. Inside, there was just one main belt and a counter belt, and much to my surprise, these 41-year-old rubber belts were still intact. So, it's not the belts. With a little prodding, I got fast forward to, to turn a little bit, but I never could get it to play, and it continued to make some weird squeaking noises. weird. In order to access the belt and flywheel, I had to remove one screw and then bend this piece of metal that was holding the circuit board in place. That seems like kind of a cheap design. Anyway, while I was in there, I, on the bottom of the circuit board, I cleaned out the record play switch and volume control by spraying a little cleaner into it and then worked them pretty good. And that took care of all the weird sounds and static that this thing was making. After I removed the belt, and was able to manually start the motor with the switch on this board here, I realized the motor was the problem. It was just getting stuck occasionally like there was a bad spot or even if the slightest resistance was applied to it. So I'm not actually going to buy a new motor for this tape deck, but I might not need to. Much like the 8-track video we did a couple years ago where it had a dead motor, I don't think it's going to take much more than just a good cleaning to get this thing going again. To access the inside of this Canon motor, I first had to remove the plastic covering by cutting and peeling that back. And then underneath that was this metal sheath around the whole motor. And then finally there were three screws. And then the back of the motor just sort of popped off. After a couple of rounds of cleaning the motor and a drop or two of oil in the right places, we were back in business. While I was in there, I also took out the flywheel and applied some grease in a few places to make sure it would turn very easily. And that's about it for the repair. Of course, we put the James Bond tape back in and I'll only be able to play a couple of seconds of it to avoid the copyright release. This recorder is so basic, there's not much to say about its features. We'll get to that in a minute. But the bigger question is, why was it around so long? Why did this design stick around? I moved on so quickly from these because the sound quality wasn't good, but this same style was being made well into the 2000s. In 2000, Radio Shack made four models of these. In 2001, they introduced three new ones. This thing had more longevity than digital compact cassette, mini disc. It was available at the same time in the 70s when smaller portable cassette recorders were available and lived on through the MP3 and digital recorder era. Why? Because. Uh, because. <laughs> well, I can tell you the reason is not sound quality. With the mono speaker, lack of a tone control, and normal bias tapes only, the sound quality is not going to be that great, and it's not going to get very loud. But when you look at this device, I think a reason for the longevity of this design is simply that it hits a sweet spot of both simplicity and portability that appeals to a lot of different types of people. Also available in 1979, for example, would be something like this JVC deck we featured in an earlier video. You can make a very high quality stereo recording and have a lot better sound with this. But what if you just needed to record your professor in a college class? 
Are you going to start plugging in microphone cables and sit near an outlet? Well, I probably would, but most people probably wouldn't. Please listen carefully. This type of shoebox recorder allows the same type of unobtrusive, unplanned recording on the fly that your smartphone does today. You just grab it and go. There's five buttons. It's battery powered. You don't have to think about anything. And it fits on a desk right next to a sheet of note paper. There's tons of utilitarian uses for this tape recorder. This sort of the same way that, you know, we've got this nice camera on our smartphone that we just use to take a picture of a to-do list or a price or something. So a very simple recorder, but it does have four jacks on the front. It's got microphone, REM, that's remote, auxiliary, and earphone. And all these jacks take basically the standard uh, one eighth of an inch phone plug. And you can see it just fits in most of those. That's really the only interesting thing about this recorder. It's so simple, but it's got all these input and output jacks. So I thought we'd talk about that for a second. This jack is essentially a mono version of the same type of jack you'd find on a modern smartphone. But what about this remote jack here? It's smaller than all the others. It takes a sub mini jack. You can see here it's a little bit smaller. And the reason is that's not for an audio signal. That is actually a switch. It sort of works like a remote pause, but it's not actually a pause. It actually disables power to the recorder and that lets you uh, control it remotely. Like they sold microphones with a switch so you could stop the recorder during an interview or something. Let's see how this works. Immediately stops playback unless the wire is shorted. A long time ago, you might have even found a cable like this used to connect it to a late 70s, early 80s computer. It had three jacks, headphone, microphone, and remote, and it allowed the computer to load programs and save programs to tape. Um, but like I said before, when you hook up the remote jack, the computer takes complete control. <laughs> So with the computer in, the, in control, it makes it difficult to fast forward and rewind or do things like that without unplugging the jack. But in 1978, this enterprising individual in Byte magazine described a circuit you could build that would let you just switch back temporarily to manual control. Anyway, that's about it. Much like the abrupt stop at the end of a tape, it's about time we brought this video to a close. That's about it. See you next time for another awesome video. Bye-bye.